I'm Tracy. And I'm Sharon. And we are Feet of Clay. Confessions of the Cult Sisters. Oh, and today, well, we've got a pretty intense topic. Yeah, Tracy, we do. Today, we are going to talk about a very profound, truly life-altering event, not only for us and not only for the hundred or so people who were there in Texas that day, but also for literally hundreds of thousands of people who were later influenced to change the course of their entire lives. Mm. That event was the private plane crash that killed Christian music legend Keith Green back on July 28, 1982. And some might ask, why are we talking about this? And we do want to reiterate that we're not trying to hurt anyone or re-traumatize anyone or really drag anyone through the mud. What we're trying to do is bring what happened that day in July out into the light. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, Sharon, we're not doing this lightly. This has actually been a, a pretty tough topic to do the research on and review, at least for me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on so many levels for me, on so many. And, you know, I I predict we're probably going to get some flack for this one, but mm -hmm. I think it's important. It is. We do have an amazing interview with Dawn Green. Dawn Zemer is her name, but she's known to most people as Keith and Melody's foster daughter, Dawn Green. She is the only living person who experienced Keith as a father. And we're going to be dropping that this month, so you will not want to miss her story. And as we realize, many listeners probably need some background on just that event and Last Days Ministries in general. Putting it into context. So those of you who've been with us on this podcast for our first dozen or so episodes, you're probably used to hearing us finding humor <laughs> And, and laughing in the midst of all this crazy shit and painful stuff we talk about. Uh, as we get into this, though, my guess today is there's not going to be a whole lot of that laughter, if any, on this topic. Yeah, but don't tune out, folks. Yes, yes, this is definitely some hard stuff, but it is really important background and insight that as you said earlier, change the trajectory of our ministry and of so many lives who ended up joining missions as a result. Yeah. And I promise there'll be in the future lots of laughter mm -hmm. and crassness in the weeks to come. So we'll make up for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And we can usually count on Sharon's salty language and innuendo for sure. Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, but in doing this, and I guess in the last few episodes, we do have to give a trigger warning again. This time, we will be talking about the crash of a private airplane and the deaths of 12 people, which also includes eight children. Mm -hmm. There will be details that could be very disturbing to some. So as always, take care of yourself and please use discretion on what you're listening to. Okay, let's get into this. For over 40 years, probably every single July since mm -hmm. 1982, there has been a controlled narrative about what happened that day. And, you know, Tracy, we, we've both remarked that as we think about it, over the last 40 years, no one else has come forward to really give any account other than the company line on all of these things with Keith and last days. Mm-hmm. I think a major driver for that narrative has been promotion. Of course, promoting a certain belief system and the, quote, kingdom of God, but there's also promotion for some pretty clear financial benefit, without a doubt. Yes, yes, there is. And it's interesting. You know, we're in July, and we're recording this and dropping this in July, and it just so happens we're on the heels of the recent news of the tourist submarine catastrophe. You know, mm -hmm. Ocean Gate made headlines. Many people were riveted to the news. The mini sub, the Titan, which took tourists down to see the wreck of the Titanic. For, for $250,000 per person. <laughs> crazy. It just seems crazy. And of course, sadly, as details have emerged about the head guy stocked in Rush, both Sharon and I have been struck with some of the very uncomfortable parallels yeah, especially hubris, 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 and arrogance and disregard for important safety measures. 
and what in essence was a sightseeing tour, a joy ride to the bottom yeah. of the ocean. And the similarities are quite disturbing. Yeah, they really are. So, you know, Tracy, you and I, we've talked about this quite a bit and thinking of this guy Stockton Rush in all the public news right now, he's viewed and portrayed as this reckless kind of money driven egomaniac whose decisions literally killed innocent people. Now, in contrast to that, there's this almost martyr status that's been conferred onto Keith Green and this kind of romanticizing of his death by many devoted Christians. And we thought, why? Why? Right. That is a very good question because uh, his death, while not on a missions trip, not going into the jungles to bring salvation to people. Not even a concert, not even going to a concert. Not even going to a concert. His death has been used to promote ideologies that are abusive. Many of his teachings cultivate guilt and self-loathing for never being committed enough as Christians like Keith was. And then this commemoration of his life and death kind of spun out and took on its own life. And it ultimately was used as a recruiting tool to funnel people into another unhealthy, controlling Christian organization that I think you and I would call a multi-level marketing organization. It is MLM. It's MLM for sure. (laughs) Youth with a Mission. And Quickly, the book came out uh, about Keith's life, the book that's often in our show notes called No Compromise, written by Melody Green. And people read that. I've heard it. I think you've heard it. Well, Melody does such a good job of just showing the faults of Keith in there. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that's not our perspective, is it, Sharon? Not quite. Not quite. I mean, you're right. People say, isn't it wonderful how honest she was and showing his shortcomings? And yes, absolutely. It is true. There are stories that do put him in a not all positive light. But I'm sorry, folks, those quote faults are talked about almost with a bit of, oh, tut tut. That was just a little unfortunate, you know, like accounts of his rudeness that makes for cute stories after the fact. And Some of it is also, hey, that's what we expect of a prophet, you know, a hard-hitting, no-compromise kind of guy who's totally sold out for Jesus. You know, these things are just part and parcel. They're just going to come along with. So yes, yes, in the book, they are admitted to as weaknesses. But these character issues, they were way more than mere weaknesses. They were actually abusive and controlling and ultimately fatal. Ultimately fatal. And remember, I mean, I loved Keith. I still Mm -hmm. love Keith. And I am always going to be thankful for certain things he brought into my life. But those good things do not offset the full story, including his part in this plane crash. Hmm. Oh, that's exactly right. So part of My revisiting of this happened over a year ago as my own son started getting his private pilot's license and then moving towards a bush pilot license. And part of, you know, his training is we would review crash reports. And that's something that the pilots do so that they can learn from and be able to avoid some of the same catastrophic mistakes that other pilots have made and has happened. And when we pulled up the Keith Green plane crash, that was the first time I'd ever, ever heard of some of the details that came from that crash report. Yeah, it's it's been really staggering, really staggering. And boy, I have run a full gamut of emotions on this. Yeah. And you and I, you know, we've talked at different times about this plane crash, but Uh, We've never fully unpacked this together, and I know I've heard some frustration and sometimes anger when we've referenced it, and I've always wondered a little bit more why you haven't expressed more grief, because I considered you as someone who was very close to Keith. Hmm. You know, I've asked myself that question, (laughs) too. I don't know that I have all the answers, but I think I'm understanding it a little bit more, uh, especially in these last few months. So, you know, in the moment there at the crash site, there was, of course, shock 
and horror and fear and confusion. And definitely there was sorrow, but I somehow walled that off. I, I walled off any expression of that sorrow. And uh, I, you know, as I told you recently, I, I didn't actually cry or grieve in that sense until just this past spring. And that's more than 40 years after the crash. Wow. Yeah. So it was just in April of 23. Um, That morning when I was kind of doing my final preparations for the interview I was going to do with Troy and Brian on their podcast, I was a teenage fundamentalist. And then again, after we finished the interview and, you know, I hung up the connection, I I was by myself And Tracy, I just sobbed. Mm. I just sobbed for the first time ever about it. And I just, Hmm. I just wanted to say, Keith, man, Keith, what, what the heck, Keith, why did you do that? And, and missing things about him that were wonderful. Yeah. Mm hmm. Well, and I think as we go into a lot of our reactions to that time, people might understand why that makes sense, that that grief was kind of put on the shelf for so long. Uh, so we'll we'll dive into that in a little bit more. Yeah, uh, yeah. But before we get into that, I want to kind of give the facts out there so that people can follow along. So what what happened? The crash itself, right? So Again, July 28th, 1982. I mean, that's a day, Sharon, that you and I, we know we don't even have to look on our calendars. We <laughs> absolutely, that's a that's a, yep. an instilled date that we notice is coming. It happened at about 7.20 in the evening, about an hour before sunset in Texas. Uh, and that would be the Garden Valley, Lindell area of East Texas. There was a twin engine plane. It was a 1973 Cessna 414, seven seaters. Uh, which typically have controls for the pilot as well as the co-pilot. And the facts, which we'll get into kind of maybe leading up to why this happened, but the plane was overloaded. Yeah. There were seven seats and 12 people Mm -hmm. that were crammed inside. So if you even do that math, not a seatbelt for everybody. Four adults and eight children. Of course, the pilot, Don Burmeister, whom we will speak about, Keith Green, Two of his children, Josiah and Bethany, who were four and two years old, and then a visiting family uh, that had just come in to visit the ministry, John and Dee Dee Smalley, and their six children, ages from 12 all the way down to about three. Yeah. And the plane was officially overloaded by almost 500 pounds, 455 to be exact. Yeah. So one thing I I know— and I haven't seen it mentioned very much, is that the plane was equipped with this aftermarket thing called a STOL kit, S-T-O-L kit. And that stands for short takeoff and landing. My understanding is that this equipment decreases the length of runway needed for takeoff and also increases the overall weight capacity of the plane. However, I'm not at all an expert on this. Mm -hmm. And I do recall there being a question after the crash whether or not the stall flaps had been engaged at the time of takeoff. And I don't remember the answer or whether that was something that could be known. Yeah, I know that in all of the reports that I've read, I've not seen or read anybody mentioning that fact. But what I have read is that the center of gravity was too far back. Yeah. And this was huge, if if not the most critical factor. Although I can't find documentation, I remember we were told at the time that at least John was riding in the very, very back of the plane, and he was a pretty big guy. And the NTSB report that you and I have been able to read said the center of gravity was too far back, so I'm assuming they had to have known the positions and estimated weights of the various passengers. I mean, I don't know how else they could have calculated that. Yes, and the NTSB, which we'll put in our show notes, stands for the National Transportation Safety Board, Mm -hmm. Uh, and they go into pretty detailed lengths whenever investigating any kind of plane crash, and it lists some, some very interesting facts The report says that in 20 to 30 second flight, the plane oscillated violently two to three times. And that means 
the nose was going up, then down, then up, then down, then up, then down. And note the word violent. Mm. That is the word used in the NTSB report. Yes. And I think some people refer to that as porpoising. And I know in talking with my son, who is now a private pilot, he talks about training that they are given to help mitigate that porpoising effect. Mm -hmm. So the facts of this crash is the plane crashed into the trees. So we had a long runway and at the end was, you know, a line of trees. And the plane kept going for about 150 feet. It had full fuel tanks. And so when it grazed the trees, it fell to the ground and exploded on impact because of the full fuel tanks. The overall ruling on multiple points was pilot error, primarily because of the overloading. And most importantly, we think from reading these reports is the improper weight balance, plus the disregard of the training requirements that were needed Mm -hmm. to fly this particular aircraft. Mm -hmm. Uh, It wasn't long before a lawsuit followed. And it was all uh, surrounding the insurance claims and the civil wrongful death from the relatives of the Smalley family. Remember, they weren't part of our ministry. They were just visiting. And last days, in the end, was held responsible and lost all those lawsuits. Right. And the insurance company was upheld as denying the claim because of negligence on the part of the ministry. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think we need to give some detail and background on Keith and Don. So Don Burmeister was 36 years old. You know, Sharon, when I think back, I used to think that seemed so old and mature. (laughs) And now uh, at the place and stage that we're in, I see that, wow, that is so young and so much in the prime of his life. Yeah. He was a Marine fighter pilot. He'd flown jets for the military and also had a degree in civil engineering. So I got to insert this. My husband is a civil engineer. And let me tell you, as a group, these are the guys who dot all the I's and cross every T to the point sometimes of annoyance. (laughs) Yes. Yes, they do, which is the other part of what makes this such an odd event. Uh, Don Burmeister was known for his big smile that could just light up his face. And that was noticeable in the time where there was a lot of severity at Last Days Ministries. Yeah. He was kind and gentle. You know, they sold everything that they had. He and his wife, who became a really close friend of mine, Janet, sold their beautiful house in the Northwest that was built into this hill with this gorgeous view to live in a trailer and put it on the Last Days Ministries property. And of course, they paid for that out of their pockets. They were volunteers. They were volunteers. At that time, we didn't provide couples housing. So if you were a couple who wanted to give of your amazing talent and skill, you still had to buy your own house and be responsible to get it on the property. Paying for the privilege of serving, right? Paying for the privilege of serving. And they had such a servant's heart. They did. And they really believed in the ministry and believed in what Keith was doing. Yeah, they did. Don also oversaw the building of the airstrip in the hangar. Now, when I got there in January of 1982, the airstrip was already built, but not the hangar, if I recall. Mm. So I don't remember what the timing of it was. I do remember flying with Don in the single engine airplane from last days to DFW, that's Dallas Fort Worth Mm. Airport. I I was 20 years old and it wasn't my first time ever in a small plane. And I do remember it feeling a little scary when we were landing because there was a steep descent. But Don still did instill confidence, even for me, scared little person, first time in a little plane. (laughs) Were there any other passengers on that plane? No, that one was just me because I think Keith and Melody and Martin and whomever else had flown ahead or both planes were going, but they were in the Cessna, the, you know, the seven seater and there wasn't enough room for me apparently. So that's why I flew in the little, the little single engine. The little one. Wow. Mm -hmm. So the day and time of the crash, uh, we can assume that Don was probably very fatigued that he had, as he had been up early flying to Dallas Mm -hmm. Also, Sharon, you'll remember this. We had required fasting once a week. Oh, that's right. Sorry. 
every fucking Wednesday, <laughs> we all were required to fast from after dinner Tuesday night until we had dinner on Wednesday night. And it was imposed. This was not optional. You had to do this whether you wanted to or not. Yes. And do you remember like when you'd have dinner, like you haven't eaten for 24 hours mm-hmm. and you'd have dinner? Do you remember how that the feeling of just absolute sluggishness of like, oh man, my yes. body now just wants to sleep because all the blood is going to my stomach? <laughs> yes. Uh, um, and especially for some of the men at the ministry who were doing some pretty hard labor through the day and then coming in very hungry. And so we can assume that that was probably not the best physical condition for Don to be in, right? Fasting right. all day, being up early, being out, fasting, and then having dinner. Uh, and then Keith comes calling to say, let's go for a plane ride. I'm getting ahead. Sorry about that. No, that <laughs> that that is true. Keith comes calling to to get in the plane ride. And I think while that's important is the other part when you listen to the pilots discuss this, there wasn't pre-flight planning done. No. And we'll get into the details of how that impacts that. But Don was not yet fully certified. I noticed that you took the single engine plane with Don and this was the twin engine plane and he was mm-hmm. not yet certified on the Cessna 414. I'm not even sure if he was certified on the single engine, you know, and and I'm going to back this up. It's the organization's responsibility, Mm -hmm. right? It is the organization, this nonprofit ministry, last day's ministries headed up by Keith Green, who reviewed every single contract. It is up to the organization to ensure compliance. So again, I'm getting ahead. I'm sorry. (laughs) Yes. So, I mean, it's a key, it's a key point in the insurance suits that would follow is that he was not certified on this. Uh, He had 59 hours as co-pilot. Yeah. And only two hours as pilot. One, One of the things I'm not certain about is whether that certification was also a legal requirement. Like were there some FAA guidelines or laws about being able to transport passengers? That I don't know about. Yeah. And I don't know the law and how much the FAA breaches into that. But I do know following my son's trajectory that there are absolutely stipulations on when you can take passengers And he follows that. And the logbook, which will come into play as we talk more about that, is very, very important to a pilot to make sure they are logging the appropriate hours that allow them to get the qualifications necessary for the certifications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely an insurance company requirement as it makes sense, right? If you're going to insure this plane, you want to make sure that the pilot in command is certified appropriately. Mm, Okay. All right. So now we're going to talk about Keith. Keith Green, he was 28 years old at the time. And as most of you probably know, or those who don't, he was pretty much the Christian music superstar of the 70s and early 80s and was touted by many, including us, to be a prophet of God. Hmm. There is this YouTube video about the crash, and we'll put a link in the show notes about it, where the guy who was doing an investigation and was trying to talk with folks and get more background says that Keith was, quote, black and white, in-your-face type personality, end quote. And that is true. That is how Keith was. But in this little video, uh, the guy also says that he, quote, interviewed another Christian artist who has spent some time with Keith and said that Keith was extremely law-abiding, felt that it was what a Christian should be about, like not even one mile over the speed limit type of (laughs) law-abiding, end quote. And I can tell you that was definitely Uh, not true, not true, far, far from it. Exactly. And I, that's actually one of my pet peeves and what irks me so much is that People, Christian musicians, Christian leaders who maybe saw Keith on the performance stage and may have hung out with him, you know, at dinner after a great concert, think that they can speak so much about the man and make public declarations. And, you know, I also, you know, had limited time with him. Sharon, you had much more time with him. But when Mm -hmm. you live in a commune setting, you get to know people pretty well. 
<laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. And, and the fact is, Keith was a huge risk taker, and he kind of prided himself in it. I will say, without a doubt, he was an unsafe driver. He was usually mm-hmm. speeding. He often passed other cars on double yellow lines, and he'd be like laughing and proud of it. And I remember when we'd ask him to slow down or like not pass that car, he'd pretty much laugh. And he'd say something like, don't you trust God? And oh. uh, <laughs> I mean, that's, oh. that, that is, and I've talked to quite a number of other people who've driven with Keith in cars and everybody has said the same thing. Oh, that is, that is, I haven't heard you say that before, but that is really bad. And the other crazy thing is he wanted to get his own pilot license. And the four of us who were on leadership, which was Martin, my my then husband, myself, Wayne and Kathleen Dillard, the four of us said, and we told him to his face, we will never fly in a plane if you are the pilot, Keith. We don't trust you. You're not safe. We will never fly with you. And not only did Keith really like taking risks and pushing the limits, he also kind of made fun of others for having any fear. And and he did it in this sort of like, Mm. sort of friendly, sort of joking way, but it was mocking nonetheless. Hmm. And it usually had also this element of kind of tying back into the idea of that person not having enough faith. Wow. Kind of like a shame game he was playing. I can totally see that. And if you think you're a prophet, I mean, what's the scripture where Satan says, you know, Jesus, cast yourself off this mountain, the angels would catch you. So I think there's definitely some belief system that would think that he may have been a little indestructible. Yeah. All right. So we're going to talk about the crash itself. And in order to really get the kind of context of what was going on that day, and I talk about how you were much closer to Keith than I was, I want to hear your history and your relationship with him leading up to the time when this happened. Okay. Well, you know, I've kind of already covered a lot of the basics in that interview with Troy and Brian. I was a teenage fundamentalist. People can go and listen to it there. Keith was like a spiritual father or or a big brother to me. Mm -hmm. And quickly, so I'll just quickly try to go. So he personally led me to the Lord when I was 14. He was 21. At his urging, I dropped out of college at age 17 and moved and joined Last Days Ministries. At 18, he arranged my marriage to the only single elder, which is funny because early 20s, but the elder Mm -hmm. at Last Days. After the wedding, and I, I was 19 when we got married, I joined the leadership team of Last Days, which was Keith, the two elders, Wayne and Martin, and then the wives, Melody, Kathleen, and me. So on a personal level, Martin and I became very, very close to Keith and Melody as far as we were spending a lot of our personal time together. We'd go to dinners, we'd go to the restaurants, we'd go out to the movies, we'd hang out at their house late at night on the weekends, we'd play games. And uh, when he planned a vacation to Europe, he wanted us to come along because he he said, hey, it's not going to be any fun without you guys. So, So we did. And Keith put us in his will to raise his children if he and Melody died. So, yeah, so it was a pretty close relationship. Yeah, so you mentioned that, and we will put in the show notes where you go into some great detail uh, with your interview with dear Troy and Brian. And when I came into the ministry, I could see that you were part of that inner circle. And I remember a couple of us in the school were, she's so young, she's so beautiful, she's so godly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and so I guess, you know, those are the facts of how you hung out with them and were pretty close. But as far as you feeling that emotional connection, either to Keith, also to Melody, and then, I mean, if you're placed as, you know, the godparents, I guess, I don't know if it was called that, of their kids, like, did you make a point to spend time with them? Like, how would you describe your emotional connection to them during this time after you were married? Well, with the kids, 
you know, I do remember when, when we'd hang out, we were often, you know, Josiah and Bethany would be around or we'd be doing things. I remember, I do remember having, I think, uh, playing with Bethany out with the horses. And as far as the feelings, you know, it's kind of confusing. So I will say that I never felt a close personal connection with Melody. And and part of that is I don't, I just don't think Melody formed close personal connections with, with really anybody. With Keith, it was confusing. So I remember when I lived in Arizona, right? I'm a teenager and we've got this long distance. He's, he's writing and calling, we're writing, calling back and forth. I really did feel a sense of his personal interest and care and concern for me, for me, the person, how am I doing? How is Sharon doing? And it was the same when I first came out to California and joined the ministry. And I think also in the beginning in Texas, um, those first, I don't know, six months or whatever. And then there was this shift. And I don't really know why. When you talk about a shift, do you know when in the story timeline that happened? I don't know if that was before Keith set up the engagement between me and Martin, if it was immediately after. I I just, I don't really remember for sure. As you said, you know, we work six days a week, 12 hours a day. So lots of stuff is a blur. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But the shift was, he became very businesslike with me. And I mean, I was definitely given a lot of responsibilities within the organization. But I noticed I would see him laughing and being very personable and kind of warm with other sisters like Michelle and Carol and Pody. But it it seemed that things and his interactions with me shifted. So there were times it fell back to that warmth, like, like he was asking me to go to livestock auctions and we'd buy cows and horses. And and uh, even towards the end, I, I remember when we took the trip to Europe, uh, eating pizza together in the train station in Milan, Italy. And the two of us were really laughing that he and I thought this was just the best pizza ever. Hmm. And those were times I could feel that connection and the warmth of friendship. And then there were other times that it was just business and distant. Hmm. I remember one time I had made this huge mistake, Tracy. I don't know if I've even told you about it. And Keith did not pound me for it in the way that I expected. It was uh, the release of his third album, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt. Uh, But this was the first album that was going to be in the whatever you can afford policy. So we were going to pack and ship these albums out to all these individuals who had placed orders. We're going to do this in our warehouse, and we had this new high-tech piece of equipment that would take rolls of corrugated material that had pressure-sensitive adhesive on one side and then was printed with Last Day's Ministry stuff on the other. Yes, I ran that album packing machine <laughs> behind you. After me, <laughs> okay. You moved on to bigger and better things. I came <laughs> up behind and did that. All right. Well, anyway, it was my job to order all this custom packaging stuff. And I had calculated, okay, how many albums are we expecting to ship? What's the linear inches for each package? What's the margin that you need for the area to cut and crimp? And so I did the math and I placed the order. So the albums arrive and we start shipping them out, you know, and it was going to be a burn just like it always is. We're going to just keep going until it's all done. Well, we're about a quarter of the way through and I start noticing that this stack of these giant rolls of corrugated they like seem to be dwindling down faster than I expected. And I had this sudden horror realizing that I had forgotten to double the linear inches needed. Oh. Because, right, each album needs to have that the packaging, you have one roll feeding at the top and one yes. roll feeding at the bottom to create mm-hmm. this package. I was just horrified at myself, like what a total failure. And I'm the reason that these albums will delay maybe by weeks or months So I went to Keith and I told him how I had just blown it. And he wasn't angry. He wasn't Mm. encouraging. He was just neutral. Hmm. And for me, that felt like such a gift from him because I I just felt horrible. And you felt, had you seen him lash out at other people or what made you dread or fear? Yeah, I had. I had seen him get impatient. I'd seen him get impatient and blaming. And um, that's what I expected. 
And you were like 19 probably at that time. You know, I don't know. We'd have to go back and see when was when was that album released? Yeah, you were young. Yeah. I mean, I was 19 or 20 at the oldest. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, when Keith was connecting with me on a personal level, it felt fantastic. Like I had mm. value for the kingdom of God and that he personally liked and enjoyed hanging out with me. And when he was kind of more clinical and businesslike, I think I internalized that to mean I wasn't as good a person as the others that he was being friendly with. Mm. And and yet he wanted me to raise his children, you know, if Keith and Mel died. So it was kind of a mind bender. Yes. <laughs> I do remember a few years later when I was pregnant with my first child, I remember feeling really sad that Keith wouldn't be there with me when I held my baby for the first time. Mm. And I think it's like recognizing, I think he held that really special place in my life and in my heart that no one else did. Yes. And I think when you uh, think about the loss for so many that day, you were one of those that lost in a very big way. Yeah. So you're, you're busy. From my perspective, you were at the helm of most of the operations, at least in the track department and the album department where I eventually came in and, and worked. And so you seem to have a lot of trust of Keith, uh, a lot of responsibility. And, you know, we would witness you guys kind of laughing and hanging out. And so imagining just the the devastating news that can you remember where you were when you knew that the plane went down? Well, I don't remember that part of it. I, I almost certainly would have been in our big red metal building. You know, that was the printing and fulfillment and data entry offices, all that sort of stuff. Um, we know that it was Wednesday evening after dinner. So we would have all been working, you know, going back into work. Yes. And for the listeners in those days, we did work till 10 p.m. So we had fasted all day, gone in, gobbled our dinner down. Mm -hmm. So you were probably back at work. I know I was downstairs in the area and I don't remember seeing you. So I assume you were probably upstairs in the red building. Do you remember who came and got you? I don't. I don't remember that. And we know because of the reports that the plane went down at about 7.20 p.m., and that's about an hour before sunset. I remember going outside, looking down the end of the runway, seeing the black smoke just billowing up from the woods, you know, down past the end. I, I can't remember who told me or how I heard. Mm -hmm. how, how about you? So I was in the track department finishing up the orders and we had a side door from the track department that went out toward the runway and toward the hangar. And mm -hmm. so somebody did come in. I think I remember who, but I, I won't say it because I'm not sure. And the question was, did you guys notice if the plane took off? And um, that made everybody in the track department walk out that door. And immediately you could see the smoke billowing from behind mm -hmm. the trees. And I remember my first thought was, maybe it's a controlled burn from one of the farmers. Mm. That's right. They used to sometimes burn the hay fields. But this was wrong time of year for that. Correct. So somebody came in and I guess said something to you, made you go outside. What What do you remember doing next? Mm. All right. So I'm going to say some of these memories are very sharp, like, you know, a photo that's in my brain or a, a video that's in my brain. And others are foggy and vague. Mm. I think I got into a car with some other folks which probably or might have been Melody and others, and drove to the end of the runway. The end of the runway, after that, there's this fence where our property ended. And then there's a field that belonged to someone else after that. And then after that field, there was woods. And we couldn't get through the fence. So somehow, you know, back up at the buildings. So then I grabbed one of the other sisters. I think she was a little younger than me. Her name was Liz. We both were into the riding of the horses. And I was like, how are we going to get, how are we going to get there? You know, I see this, it's off in the woods. There's no roads that's way off the highway. So we go and grab two horses and saddle them up super fast and just go galloping, mm. riding through the woods to try to get to this crash site. Wow. 
Uh, did you see anything? So let me back up. So the w- ones of us who went out and obviously we could see some smoke at that point, sisters were coming to us. Hey, do you guys know where the pilots are? So everyone's trying to put together if a plane went out. No one still knew if a plane went up or not. But you could feel the frenzied activity starting to happen. So I guess in the midst of that, you are taking horses and going out and we all are in a circle just joining hands and starting to pray. Mm -hmm. And did you see anything from that end of the runway? Well, no. See, I went off to the left, the hills and the woods on the left, and we got through and around the fencing area and into the open wooded area. And came up to the crash site. And it was still smoldering. Oh, wow. There's this big black burned area, of course, all around this charred and mangled plain fuselage. The trees all around it, they're broken, they're burned. All the leaves are gone, right? So it's these bare, scorched branches and tree trunks. Um, A friend I've talked to recently remembers seeing lots and lots of the kids' flip-flops on the ground just strewn around. Uh, I, I didn't recall that. But I, you know, like I said, I wonder how much of what I remember is what I really saw or was some of it later what I dreamed One thing that I see so clearly is an image of a charred body still Mm. sitting in a seat with a blackened skull. Oh, Sharon. I remember wondering which which one of these is Keith. So at that time, were you sure that Keith was on the plane? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, I think I was. I, I, you know what? I don't remember at that point. No, yeah, I was because with Melody, you know, we n- knew that Keith was on the plane because, cause, yeah, being originally trying to get to the site earlier with Mel. Mm, that's right. Because I think at that time she was the only one cause, because there was no pre-flight planning. I think she was the only one who knew had who had gone up because exactly the rest who. of us were still very confused yeah. at who was the pilot and, and what had happened. I don't know if I knew the kids were on board at that oh, point or anybody. Yeah. I, I I mean, it would just be I knew Keith was. And mm. I don't remember any smell. It was eerie and quiet. You know, there's like, there's no talking. <laughs> there's no music playing like oh, in a movie. It's just devastating. Yeah, it's just quiet. There were some other people there. Liz, who I mentioned, who came with me on the horses. There were a few brothers. There were a few sisters. Uh, Martin had gotten there. Wayne had gotten there. Mm. I think I remember seeing Melody from a distance on the other side. Oh, my God. I remember walking around the wreckage, definitely in shock, standing there, looking at it. It was just surreal. Uh, it started to get dark, and I don't remember if we got back on the horses to ride them or just walked and led them back through the woods and the fields as it just grew darker. And do you remember the storm that came in? And do you remember if you had made it back before the storm rolled in? I don't remember the storm. I hear other people talking about it. I think I was just so in my head, just Mm -hmm. so in my head. uh, I do not remember the storm. So in East Texas, you know, storms were not unusual to come through, but, and I, I would have to look up the weather reports to know exactly at what time it happened in relation to the crash. But the darkness that you did seem settling over was more than just evening settling in. A very intense lightning and thunderstorm was rolling in. The sky grew intensely dark and the streaks of lightning were dramatic and the bolts of thunder were were like epic uh, that was happening. I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to laugh right now, even though I said I probably wouldn't. It's like, wow, that makes for a really great narrative for a movie, doesn't it? It it does. (laughs) And of course, we're so conditioned to, you know, read the signs and see what is happening. And it was 
a dramatic thunderstorm. And of course, the narrative began, you know, internally along amongst several of us brothers and sisters is God is demonstrating his grief, right? He mm. is demonstrating his grief in the heavens as we are as we are taking all this in. And lots of theology gets mixed up on, you know, everything. But I think the overarching thought was the devil has struck mm. God's anointed and God is angry and what the devil has done and meant for bad, <laughs> God will turn it and mean for good. And that is a narrative that I think continues to this day. Oh my God. Okay. So I'm just going to say this, Martin and I and Wayne and Kathleen, I remember the four of us getting together privately and we were all, obviously we've got shock and numbness and confusion and... Mm. I think our overwhelming feeling was anger. Wow. Was like, Keith, why did you do such a stupid thing? Mm -hmm. I mean, every one of us felt like he was the one responsible for this. And, and I felt like, Keith, why did you do this to us? Now you've left us this mess. What oh. were you thinking? Those were my thoughts for sure. Well, that's interesting because those thoughts never funneled back down to the rest of us. Of course not. Too much to protect. Too much to protect, but I don't ever remember hearing that there was anger at Keith for being reckless and irresponsible. Yeah. Huh. So I don't know when you had those private meetings. I don't know how, how many days or hours after the event that that took place. You know, I don't remember exactly either, but it was, it was pretty quickly. Yeah. And then, and you, you know, said at the beginning of this that you didn't grieve for many, many, many years later, which is, is not uncommon for people who have trauma responses, conditioned trauma responses. But do you remember what you did start doing? So it's funny because some of this I don't remember doing, but other people hmm. have told me that I did. So I apparently gathered everybody together and said, everyone needs to call their parents so that they know you're safe and that you weren't killed. And I think we did some organizing to get the phones manned because it's like, okay, you did. we're going to start getting calls. <laughs> you did. And that was me. And I think I was obviously in shock uh, that all this was happening. And then I got appointed to be on the phones. And I remember thinking, because there wasn't any internet. And of course there was the Christian radio stations, <laughs> but I don't think I thought of how quickly this news would travel across the right. country. And I remember thinking, because my dad, my mom uh, was in the hospital at the time. I was like, my dad's not going to hear about this. <laughs> it's like, why am I going to call my dad? <laughs> like, who's going to be calling us? So I, I did get put on the phones and I don't know how many of us there were, uh, but there were several of us. And I'm telling you, they, they rang nonstop. Yeah. Non-stop, we got calls from around the world asking about what had happened and, you know, was the ministry going to go on? I mean, some and some people in goodness just called just to share, you know, their sorrow and that they're praying for us. But, you know, some of the questions that came that night, you know, is the ministry going to go on? Who's going to run it? Are you going to try to raise Keith from the dead? I mean, it was like <laughs> oh, a man. lot to be fielding. Yeah, yeah. And you were fairly new to LDM, right? Because you'd just gone through the first ICT school in January. So you were there seven months max. Yes. You were in the second term of ICT, which is just a polite way of saying you were a working volunteer paying us for the privilege of your servanthood. I was a working <laughs> volunteer, but we were kind of an elite class. I'm going to say that. We used to joke that LDM time was like Narnia time because we worked so much. And so <laughs> I hadn't heard that one. <laughs> yeah. And so it was like a day in LDM is like, you know, five months out in the real world. And so <laughs> you, you bonded very quickly. And one of the things when they put me in charge of the track department was, you know, it's like in Narnia time, they give you this golden scepter. You are now the maintenance machinery guru. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, it's my job now to maintenance all of, you know, the shrink wrap machine, the bun tire. And I was like, have you ever done this? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> 
but it was almost assumed that if God is calling you, I mean, it bled into even jobs as mundane as running equipment. If God is calling you to this position, you have to receive his anointing to do it. He will equip you. God will equip you. <laughs> he, he will equip you. And that is how I actually got some interaction with Don Burmeister because I was kind of told in typical last day's double speak of, if you run into a problem, you can ask Don Burmeister, but basically don't bug him because he's really important and has more important things on his <laughs> mind. And he, he came across the field one day seeking me out with a big smile. And he's like, I hear you're in charge of the track department. Have you ever like run, you know, a shrink wrap machine? I said, no. And he goes, well, come with me. Let me show it to you. Oh, and just with the most generous spirit, and I remember him looking in, at me and saying, do you sew? And I said, yes, I do sew. And he's like, this is basically a glorified sewing machine. If you know how to oil a sewing machine, you're going to be fine on this. He was just so amazing and mm. walked me through you know, everything that I would need to do. And I was like, if you ever need me for anything, don't hesitate to call me. You know, and then uh, for a little stint, I was also in charge of driving Josiah to his preschool in Van, Texas. And he was a sharp little cookie. I remember arguing with him on the way to school one day <laughs> and um, stepping back and going, I'm arguing with a four year old. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I arguing with the four-year-old? <laughs> it was like his daddy, man. He was smart. <laughs> he was. And my nephew was born months apart from him. And I really miss my nephew. So it was a special gift for me to kind of hang out with him because I, I loved I loved children and I loved that age. So when when it happened and you know immediately the jobs were dished out. It made complete logical sense to me that we second termers would be put on the phones because we wanted to give the staff who had kind of come with him from California and who were really bonded the chance to have time to grieve. Mm -hmm. And so I think many of us, we were trying to step in and do any work that we could to ease the burden on, on you all who had, you know, just experienced a loss we couldn't even put into words. Here are a few thoughts from others. When I was at Last Days in 1982, I was known as Liz Jeffries. I was 18 years old when the plane crashed. And I've kind of surprised myself here over 40 years ago, this all happened and I find myself quite emotional about it. That was a Wednesday, it was a fast day. That day we had had a prayer meeting and I remember in the ranch house and I remember Keith was so excited because he pulled a piece of crumpled paper out of his pocket and he read to us an article that he thought would be great for the newsletter. I believe it was by William Booth and it was called How to Find God and that is one of my memories of that day. My name is Paul and I was relatively new to Last Days Ministries at the time of the crash. I had attended the second ICT school in April and was then asked to stay on board to help lead the next school and that's when the crash occurred during that school. So I did not have a lot of direct contact with the ministry at large, though did go to prayer meetings and things like that. And I only had one one-on-one -on -one conversation with Keith, and that was, as it turns out, the afternoon of the crash. He came up to me and asked me how the school was going, how I was doing. Um, yeah, that's something that I won't forget in that context was my only conversation was that that day and he was gone a few hours later. My name is Linda and I was Keith and Melody's nanny living in their home for about a year and a half before the plane crash, caring for their children, Josiah, Bethany, and Rebecca. There was no intensive Christian training school when I joined last days, so they were sending staff members to be students at ICT a little at a time, and it was my turn to go. So only a couple of days before the crash, I left the Greens home and went to stay at the ICT house. 
At any rate, the plane crashed. It was obviously a big commotion of what is going on, people running and everything. And I remember uh, I was downstairs near the loading dock of the building and some other staff members had been outside near the runway and somebody was completely tired out from rushing, trying to get to the building. And they hollered up to me, call Keith and tell him the plane went down. So I, I went right inside the building there. I, I just grabbed the wall phone and I called Keith's house and Mel answered. And I said, <clears throat> Mel, is Keith there? And she said, I don't know what she said, but I just said to her in a hurry, I said, well, tell Keith that the plane went down. And she was like, what? And I said, I don't know. Just tell Keith that the plane went down. And that was the end of that conversation. And Pretty soon, then I went outside of the building, and pretty soon, um, here came Melody driving the lime wagon, her and Keith's car, and we were all, a lot of us were running down the runway, and Melody would stop and pick some of us up. We were in the car, we are rushing, rushing down to the end, and then we'd stop and get somebody else, and it became very apparent to a couple of us that we were not all going to fit in Mel's car. Someone had the idea of going back and getting some horses. And so a few of us went back and saddled some horses. But it didn't make any difference. And I was 18. And I remember my husband, I later, I later married Matt Schoenfelder. He, he would have been 23 at the time. We were all such kids. And... <laughs> Eventually, I was at the at the crash site, and in this really dense part of the woods, there was just this entire, just a huge area of just char. There was nothing but just blackened earth and black blackened area surrounded by just jungle. It felt like the impression that I have was just. I just remember how many children's flip flops were everywhere in the in the crash area. It's very difficult. <laughs> that evening, we were leading small groups, and I got a knock on the door and was pulled out and was told by Wayne that the plane had gone down and that I needed to go get Dawn and bring her to Melody's house. So I went up there and talked to Kathleen let her know what was happening. And so I took Dawn, put her in the van, and took her to Melody's house. I believe that I was instructed not to tell her what happened, so I just was sitting next to her feeling, oh my gosh, this poor young woman's life's about to change in a very drastic way. And I couldn't say anything. I wanted to reach out and touch her and just, just I don't want to say calmer, but that was fully against the rules back then. So I dropped her off at Melody's, and then I went back to the schoolhouse. We all were walking back, just silent and just dumbfounded. And just a, a light summer rain started just sprinkling over us. It was very gentle, and we're walking down the runway back to the ministry. It was just so surreal. When the news came of a plane crash, uh, we, the students at ICT, were only told to pray, not that anyone had died. It took a while for them to reveal that to us. Later that evening, a number of the students and I were on the driveway of the schoolhouse, which was closer to the crash site than any of the facilities on the ranch. And we can see to the north, right where the, the crash site was, an incredible thunderstorm just hovering over the spot. Tremendous lightning, tremendous thunder. And it was just standing there. And we were just in awe, just no words were spoken at that moment. A little later, we all just kind of agreed that boy was God mad. God was mad. This was not God's will. This is not supposed to happen. So that's the way we process that in that moment. 
but it was probably the first time in my life that I felt the tangible grace of God, just like this blanket. Early the next morning, the teacher who was there at this at teaching in the school asked me to take him to the crash site. So we got in the van and and we found our way to the plane and to the wreckage and there was nobody else there. It was just he and I. And all he could say the whole time was, Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. So you're in this incredible space geographically, spiritually, where there's just a great tragedy and this sense of eternity. And that's what struck me personally the most. I was standing right up against the, the plane and looking directly down in it. And the sense that came to me in the energy of the moment was, I'm staring right into eternity. A few short hours ago, all these people were alive and now they're not. So I'm just looking in there and just saying, my God, what happened here? Just this sense of loss. In the days that followed, they just kept us on our schedule of daily video teachings and chores to keep things normal. So I had no updates as to what was going on. You see, when you were a staff member going through the ICT school, the leaders felt it was important that you be separated from the regular ministry and staff um, and not shown any kind of favoritism over the other ICT students to make sure, I, I guess, that you were humble. <laughs> so I was pretty much kept out of the loop as to what was happening with Melody and the LDM organization and, one of, and was unable to get together with other staff members to grieve. Because I had spent the last year and a half continually caring for and loving Josiah and Bethany, there was a significant amount of grief that I felt for those two little people that I loved. I was trying to process things the best I could by myself. When I drove over to one of the meetings where they're doing a the communication about the next steps, what's going to happen, I pulled in by myself in the van for the school, and in my rearview mirror, I saw Martin and Wayne, two of the remaining elders, up against the fence by one of the pastures, just hugging and crying. And I remember saying, don't do that. Don't do that, guys. Come on. Don't cry. You know, it was like such ache, such loss that everybody was feeling. No matter how much you knew any of them, there was just so much loss. I remember one night watching the news and the local channel had done a piece on the crash and uh, the camera, camera panned in and zeroed in on one of Josiah's sandals that had survived the crash laying on the ground. And I just, when I saw that, it was really hard. I just remembered how many times I had put that sandal on Josiah every day and um, really made me, you know, so sick, and I cried a lot. Um, I know it was hard for a lot of people. It would have been really helpful to me at the time if the leaders would have made an exception to the, the, the norm and allowed me to meet with my friends on staff to process things, especially right after it had happened, as it was an extenuating circumstance. But... Um, it wasn't allowed, so uh, it was a very sad and confusing time, uh, as it was for everybody who loved and knew them. It was especially hard for me with losing Don Burmeister because he and Janet had just been just a very precious um I looked up to them, and especially Don was a father figure to me. He was just a quiet gentleman and had such a beautiful family. And little did I know, 20 years later, I too would be a widow with two little boys. And Don's wife came and ministered to me in Pennsylvania. And yeah, just ties that bind love and the things that we experience together.
I, I think I kind of just went into crisis management mode. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure a good bit of dissociation with my background. I was quite good at that. Um, yeah, so it was really focusing on really focusing on the practical. Yes, and I think so many of us were were having to do that uh, because obviously the people that were the most impacted, I think we were trying to make room for them and us, you know, kind of pushing aside any grief that we might be feeling uh, so that we could do that. And I remember watching you that you really did go into, into work mode. Mm-hmm. Yep, I did. I don't remember, but I think some people have said that we then declared a fast on the heels of all of this. So oh my God, I don't remember, but <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it at all. <laughs> yes. And I think it was because it was such a, an earth shattering event. We didn't know, you know, his last day's ministry is going to close its doors. What's going to happen. So yes, let's take all these young grieving people. And for many, this would be their first confrontation with death. Let's, let's make them fast and put them to work. Mm-hmm. And see if they can pray and be holy enough to find out, you know, what God's mm. plan for us as a ministry would be. Yeah, those um, hours, days, weeks, and months that followed, uh, some of it's a blur. Some of it's pretty clear. I will never forget taking the call from the coroner's office. Um, not sure why it was me. Again, maybe I'm just, you know, going into crisis administrative mode. I mean, you were good at that. You were good mm-hmm. at that. I, I yeah. think we had said in another episode, you know, that children of alcoholics make good cult members. <laughs> and um, I know I read somewhere else, too, that, you know, people who have in, endured trauma, they're great in crises. And mm-hmm. I think it was definitely... I know I went into that mode easily as well, but I was mm-hmm. layers removed, I think, from some of the personal connections. And you being so personally connected still went into organizational mode. But when I look at it, who else would have? I mean, that was that was your skill set. Yeah, that was me. Well, so, yeah, so I'm on the phone with the coroner's office who is reporting the official cause of death after the autopsies. Uh, I remember I I had just turned 21 Mm -hmm. and I felt so bad for Melody. You know, I I wasn't sure what is the best thing to say. I remember going to her, hoping that the information would help ease her mind, that they did not suffer long. I mean, especially the children. I mean, what just unthinkable, unthinkable tragedy. Mm. Um, the coroner's report was that it was almost instant death because of inhaling the superheated air, you know, from the the fuel tanks exploding and everything just being this giant fireball. So basically the inside of their lungs being scorched. And then from that lack of oxygen would have been pretty much immediate unconsciousness. So oh, that, that was just awful. That that is, and that you were the one that had to break that news had to have been very, very, very tough. Yeah. And you know, in the midst of this, the whole Christian world is trying to make sense of all of this confusion. You know, for me, it's part of that. We'll often refer to the double speak. You know, the most exciting thing for a Christian is to stand before Jesus, and yet this is the biggest grief that that we've all experienced. And so. You know, how how do you even properly grieve when, you know, at the same time, there's people telling you, it's like, that's all he wanted. That's all Keith wanted was just to be with Jesus. And now he is with Jesus. And then, you know, you're seeing all of these children that didn't get to live their life. Mm, mm-hmm. And so within a maybe a day or two, the scripture starts to emerge in many corners. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John twelve twenty four, mm-hmm. and so all of the yeah, okay. sudden, I just want to say this: that grain of wheat thing came up almost immediately, and it is mm-hmm. huge. It is huge. But let's can we talk about that more in detail toward the end of this episode? Yes. Okay. Okay. So you know, Martin and I and Wayne and Kath. One of the big questions we had was like, should last days even continue? And then there was the leadership question. Keith's gone. 
what's our structure going to be? You know, because it was the three male elders and we all did believe that, you know, women should not be in leadership. We looked to <laughs> Leonard Ravenhill. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> You know, we look to Leonard Ravenhill, we're meeting with him, we're praying with him, you know, Leonard, give us counsel. But then YWAM, Youth with a Mission, gets involved and they've got uh. their own agenda. And Tracy, that's got to be a whole another episode as well. Yes, that does. And all I can think of is Miley Cyrus's song, YWAM came in like a wrecking ball. <laughs> and... I obviously have some hindsight on this, but even at the time, I remember there being a bit of emotional whiplash uh, that I would yeah. later come to understand is pretty typical in these types of scenarios. But it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what? Well, it's the immediate pivot to this whole memorial concert tour, you know, which the goal is we want to recruit 100,000 missionaries for YWAM, which is basically 100,000 paying missionaries to support this MLM structure. And yeah, it was just let's off to the races with that pretty quick. Yes, it was. Okay. And, you know, Tracy, again, we're going to get ahead. That's got to be a whole other different discussion. Let's let's kind of come back to this aspects of the crash. So the investigation and the rulings about the technical aspects, I'm not sure who received that info. I'm assuming it was Wayne and Martin and Melody. Um, I don't recall being part of those specific discussions, but it is possible. That is interesting to me because I assumed that you would be all involved in that. Yeah, I just don't remember. I don't remember. So the insurance wouldn't pay. Obviously, yeah. there's a, a whole kind of deep dive into the case that went before the courts on, you know, proving who was at fault. But to sum it all up, it was corporate negligence. The yeah. pilot in command was not properly certified. He didn't have the proper hours. And uh, so we were held liable. Mm -hmm. And this, from my perspective, was hazy because I guess I assumed that in any bad thing, there's usually always a lawsuit. But I remember being pretty stunned that a Christian family, uh, the Smalley family, though they were visiting, I understood their parents to be Christians, that they would file a lawsuit against a Christian ministry uh, <laughs> because, you know, these bad things happen, but who sues? <laughs> right. But remember, even me in, in quote leadership, I did not know the extent of the violations and the extent of responsibility that the organization slash parentheses Keith Green had in what took place. None of us did. And I no. think, you know, I remember having prayer and fasting meetings on Wednesday, praying for this specific lawsuit. And of course, our prayers were like, turn the heart of the judge, turn the heart of the people to stop this against God's amazing people. And I, I do remember, you know, being somewhat incensed that they would add this insult on top of mm -hmm. everyone's pain. Mm -hmm. And of course, now I'm older and I look back and I think this family lost eight people. Mm -hmm. And we will get into just all of the, the facts and the details. But just to say, none of us at last days knew this. <laughs> and no. I assumed Sharon would have known this. But if she didn't even know, know this, the rest of us were very clueless onto the details. And I'm going to say again, remember, I could have been in on it. I might have just been dissociated and in a fog, but it has struck me as new information that is a surprise to me. Mm. So my guess is I was not in the loop for some of those discussions. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that immediately knowing Keith so well, you, you definitely felt that he was complicit. And I know that in our conversations, you have mentioned some of that. And so for here on our podcast, is there anything publicly that you would like to go on record as far as Keith's complicity in this plane crash? So we've definitely had some intense private discussions. And no one else is really going forward publicly that I know of and saying these things. So I feel... I need and want to. In a previous episode, I don't remember which one it was, there was some brief reference to the crash. And I said that the cause was arrogance and gravity. And 
I now also want to add two other things to that, especially after this kind of deep dive you and I have been doing, reviewing everything. I think we need to add ego indulgence and gross negligence. That's what contributed to this crash. So this new realization, (laughs) part of me wants to say, duh, as I've finally allowed myself to really think through all of this, is indulgence. Why did we need a private plane at all, let alone two? Hmm. So this money, this money that's spent to build a 3,500-foot airstrip and to lease these planes and to keep pilots and their families on staff, what is that but an indulgence? And and okay, Keith wasn't buying furs and jewelry and mansions, so it's, it's not quite to the righteous gemstones level. <laughs> By the way, great, great series. You got to watch it, you know, but still kind of like, what the fuck? Because we did not have the money to pay the staff, right? So people aren't getting paid wages for the 12 hours a day, six days a week they're working. We're not even letting people have two glasses of orange juice at breakfast. Remember that? It's limited what you can eat. It's limited. Milk and orange juice rationed. Yeah, uh, so. Bathrooms. Bathrooms rationed. (laughs) 10 to 12 to a bathroom. You weren't allowed to flush the toilet. Oh, my God. (laughs) I didn't even think about that. Yeah, we don't have the money to add another bathroom and septic system, but we can build an airstrip and we can build a a giant mm. hangar, and we can lease these planes. So, okay, all this other stuff not being done because of funding, and yet we have the money for these airplanes. I never thought about two because I'm thinking, okay, if you're flying around a lot, but... Two, and it's not like it's life-changing in terms of the time saving. So the drive to Dallas-Fort Worth, it was less than two hours, Right now, when I Google it, it says from Garden Valley to DFW, it's an hour and a half. And this is before TSA, right? So you're just going to walk on a plane. Dallas is this major hub with lots of nonstop flights. So it's not like having this private plane is going to save 20 hours of travel every week. It's not doing that. And even how much time it did, quote unquote, save, which I'm doubtful, was Keith's time really that valuable? I mean, back then it never occurred to me. I'm thinking all's good. I I didn't think anything was about the money, but these were donations. Or maybe it's coming from his music royalties. I don't know. But again, I'm going to go back to we're pretty much using slave labor volunteers. We can't let people have two glasses of orange juice, but we're going to have these planes. So that's where I say this was ego and indulgence. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know if you remember, you probably never got assigned to this, but when I came on, people had the job of having to go out and manually clear rocks from the runway, like literally bend over and pick up rocks to clear from the runway. Oh my God. I do. Now that you say it, I do remember that. Oh my God. Yes. And I didn't have to do it. I remember one time being sent out and it was almost done. So it wasn't very long, but having to bend over. And I remember thinking, this is ridiculous that I'm clearing rocks off of the (laughs) runway. And then immediately was checked, that great check in your spirit. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, that just shows how much pride I have that I'm not willing to be out here in the Texas heat clearing rocks off a runway. Well, good for you for humbling yourself. Good for you for doing that. So, (laughs) (laughs) all right. So that's like the whole indulgence aspect of this. All right. Next for me. Okay. Before you go, before you go on, do you remember being in leadership meetings where this was discussed about the need for an airplane or a hangar? I don't. I may have been in them, but I think I was kind of blinded. I had so much faith in Keith's good intention Mm. and hearing from God. And of course, we're not misusing God's resources. You know, I think I was just, I just was blind to it, to be honest. Hmm. So jump into the next one that is that new, really smack in the face realization. The organizational and corporate gross negligence. So Keith is the top executive of this nonprofit organization, Last Days Ministries. He's in charge of the entire operation. So the buck stopped with him. Everything at Last Days was under Keith's full control and decision-making. Everything. 
contracts, finances, you know, operational processes, who's going to work in what key positions, the schedule we kept, all of this was Keith's control. Yes, it was Keith's control. And I have to just share this little memory um, and we might be cutting it out. But do you remember when Art Katz came to visit? And Art Katz, people can Google him, but I remember him teaching in the ranch house and Keith was off to the side and Art Katz chastised him for making us work so long. Mm. (laughs) And Keith did that little grin of like kind of the shrug of the shoulders So he absolutely knew our schedules. He absolutely, I think, had been challenged by other ministry leaders, and still we worked very long hours. Yes, we did. Well, and again, you know, okay, he's the head executive of this nonprofit organization. He did not ensure we complied with regulatory and insurance requirements for those planes. So the pilot training and the certifications, and remember again, Keith is the one who tells Don to make this flight, this tragic flight. So, I mean, I'm not even talking about civil liability or criminal liability. I don't know if there really was such a thing for the deaths of all these people. But like the value of the plane itself wasn't covered by insurance Correct. because of noncompliance, because of gross negligence. Mm. And the FAA their actual statement was company management did not comply with insurance stipulations, which required pilot of the flight to attend a Cessna flight training school, nor did the pilot satisfy the minimum hour requirements. And I'm going to tell you, Keith was a contract guy. He would read every single word of a contract, man. He knew them inside and out. So he either negligently signed off on things without reading them, which that is negligence, or he read them and he knew and he just didn't fucking give a shit enough to comply because other things were too important. Yes. And it goes along if, you know, he is a risk taker and if he genuinely, eh, you know, what do these people know? My pilots are good. I don't have to comply with these silly rules. I could totally see him going from that angle. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, gross negligence, that rested totally on Keith's shoulders. Mm. So the next one, this one to me is the most subtle and the most sinister. And that is this spiritual arrogance and spiritual abuse. The leadership structure at last days, and more importantly, Keith's own leadership style and choices He was spiritually a very controlling person and sometimes abusive. You know, I I told you I've seen him be kind of a bully. I've seen him mock and make fun of people. There were times he could just be, you couldn't describe him as anything other than just being a dick. And remember, I loved Keith. So Sharon, that message does not sit well with a lot of people. (laughs) It, It just doesn't. When you say the word bully, people are like, well, he was just a human. Yeah, no, fine. Well, you weren't close enough to him to see it. Hmm. What can I say? I saw it. I saw it. I was the one who, you know what? Let's just leave it at that. (laughs) We just got to leave it at that. Because people who want to idolize someone, who want to assume that anything negative about them can't possibly be true, there's nothing you're going to do about that. They're going to want to believe what they want to believe. And, and, you know, that's fine. But you know what really makes me sad is how quickly people would definitely believe and label Don a people pleaser, right? Mm -hmm. Because that was one of the things that was said. Well, you know, maybe Don was just weak because he just was a people pleaser. And that is a slam in the Christian narrative for those who aren't Christian. I mean, that idea, oh, that's a horrible, horrible thing to be a people pleaser. That just shows weakness of character and yielding to sin and not trusting God. Well, the truth is Don wanted to please God. That's why he joined LDM. And I saw this video analysis And Tracy, you just shared this with me recently. Uh, There's this website, flightsafetydetectives.com. It's these three experts and combined, they've got over 100 years of aviation accident investigation and safety experience. So one of the things that they said in this video 
looking at the crash that killed Keith, what they said hit me like a ton of bricks. Mm -hmm. Quote, you have to shake your head because where's the logic? Who in their right mind as an aviator, especially someone that was as structured and disciplined as a military aviator, would just throw the rule book right out the window and go, oh yeah, let's just stuff all these people in this airplane, even if they can't sit in a seat, let's just kick the tires, light the fires and go, end quote. Mm, That hit me like a ton of bricks too. Yeah. And I'm going to follow on that in just a second. But another thing they said is, quote, you see a tragic accident like this, where eight Mm. kids were killed because of one human and his stupidity, end quote. Here's the thing. Don was not in his right mind. He was being manipulated by a cult leader. Mm. And it was not the stupidity of one human. It was two. And the question remains, which one bore greater culpability? Don or Keith? Oh, Sharon. I know. I know. So hear me out. Keith and last days, there was this culture of submission to leaders, not questioning, trusting in God to lead through the leaders, right? Lots of Bible Mm -hmm. studies about this. We were subjected to lots of Bible studies about this. And these extreme teachings at last days about this submission to leadership These were just another foundation stone in manipulative control. Now, there's a lot out there in the public space these days about high control groups, and they don't have to be Mm -hmm. religious. The documentaries on the Nexium organization, which is N-X-I-V-M, right? On HBO, there's the docuseries The Vow. There was one on, what was the other one, Tracy? Was it Netflix? Yes, and I can't think of the name. Yeah. So anyway, we'll we'll find it and put it in the show notes. An example of a high control, charismatic leader who can get people to do things they never would otherwise do, do things that no one in their right mind would do. Hmm. That was secular. Add in this situation, add someone's belief in a God and that they want to do nothing more than please God and the belief that God has set this leader over them, and the leader reinforcing the idea that the leader is speaking for God, that is a very dangerous, and in this case, a deadly combination. So spiritual coercion was absolutely a fact of life at Last Days Ministries. Yes, it was. And that would be just to even your normal leaders, but then you factor in Keith's intense, coercive personality on top of that. Mm -hmm. And you have a very difficult situation where you would try to come against him. Yeah. Oh, Sharon, that's so heavy. And that's so well stated because people will say, well, why are you doing this? And this is exactly why we're doing this. Because when you look at the facts of the case, this is the deadly combination that you know, in this case, absolutely cost people their lives. It did. And in other spaces, it is costing people their psyches, their self-esteem. And we are doing our best to bring this out into the light. Again, from mm-hmm. the beginning, we're not trying to drag people through the mud. We're trying to drag it out into the light so that people can avoid this combination in the future. Yeah. Yeah. And again, remember, part of this for me is... I hate it the way Don has been portrayed publicly as just a people pleaser. And I want to be clear, though. I mean, Don was the pilot. He made the absolutely wrong choice to put too many people in that plane. There is no justification. There's there's no way around it. He, He blew it. And as I watched those YouTube videos about the crash, I just got angrier and angrier for Don's reputation. It's just awful. It just is awful. And I think Tracy, about the burden, the psychological and emotional burden that went on to Janet and to their sons, Mm -hmm. right? And I'm sure you remember this too. I I remember the prayer meetings. I remember the prayer meetings that we were all in and they are there. And they were struggling with this horrible shame, which may have been completely false, false shame and guilt. 
at the idea that their husband, their father, was responsible for killing the one and only Keith Green, Uh. when in fact, it may have been more the other way around. And it's just, it's just awful. It's just awful. It is awful. And that is one of the big purposes of the NTSB examining flight uh, crashes for that purpose. There's a lot on record when you have high profile people who put pressure on pilots to do things that they wouldn't normally do. And we know that happens. There's been some recent crashes where, you know, that has happened. Uh, where people are flying in fog or people are flying in bad weather conditions because a very important person needs to get somewhere. But adding the cult element as far as the conditioning of obeying your leaders, hearing from God that you can do all things through Christ and that this leader is putting that on you is a whole different element that there aren't a lot of studies on because that doesn't usually come into play. Right, And that is definitely a sobering look at what happened on that day in July. Mm -hmm. And I do know that there was a struggle with some guilt from the pilot's wife. I didn't quite understand it at the time because in my head it was, you know, bad things happen. (laughs) And understanding that that they bore that weight because the report clearly states pilot in command multiple times. When you read the report, I mean, it's pilot in command, pilot in command, pilot in command. That's where all of the fault lies. And Mm -hmm. I think that's really hard to be in a ministry where you, you, you were married to that pilot and ultimately had to be a part of the ministry for years where we are trying to bring the tale forward that this is, you know, used by God for his glory. This is what infuriates me now. I remember, I remember being in these prayer meetings on the floor, in the ranch house, on the red carpet. And I remember those two little boys praying out loud, for God somehow to use this for his glory, to use Keith's death for the glory of the kingdom, while they are still bearing mm. the grief of their own father. It's just it's just sickening. It just infuriates me now. And I've always believed that they deserved to be validated and that the memory of their father needed to be restored to the honor he deserves in their eyes. And, you know, Tracy, I'm going to say this. I am certain to the point that if my own kids' lives literally depended on my correct assessment of this, wow, <laughs> I am certain that Don would have tried to tell Keith, no, Keith, this is too many people. And Keith would have done some sort of joke-like little shaming thing, little emotional arm twisting, and pulled the card, don't you trust God and the leadership he's put over you? Some version of that, some version of that is what I believe happened. And on the one hand, again, absolutely no excuse for Don as a pilot, none whatsoever. And on the other hand, recent documentaries and all this information about cult situations have validated that the manipulation and mind control can become virtually impossible to resist. I know Hmm. how Keith did this kind of stuff. I saw it firsthand repeatedly. I fell prey to it myself. And it's not that I think Keith had bad intent to purposefully harm anyone. Of course not. Of course not. But he was self-absorbed. He was self-righteous. He was self-serving. And the damage to others was just a byproduct. (sighs) Yeah, that is uh, a lot to take in, especially when you follow the story uh, from that day, even till now. And that brings us back to that unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies. So Sharon, let's dissect this and find out why we think that was able to spin up with such power and why we needed to paint that picture. Well, I mean, the first one is just absolutely the humanness of it all, right? Of, Of needing comfort, of needing to make some sort of sense in the face of just unspeakable tragedy, right? I mean, that's just human nature. Everyone needs that. So I think that was part of the spiritualizing and the and the justifying. But the questions that were being wrestled with was, was this the work of the devil? 
was this God's choice? Was this man's accident, right? So it wasn't like nature, like a thunderstorm. And I think Christians today who still have a belief in whatever their doctrines are and still honor Keith, I wonder what do they do with this, right? What, how, how do they explain this thing? Yeah, and it's interesting. We mentioned at the top of the show about the sub that went down, and there's no spiritualizing that, right? It's very right. clear. People are coming out and saying, <laughs> you know, hubris drove this. And that was not the case in this story, and it's still not the case. And, you know, like I said, you have some people, huh, this is where you get all that Bible gymnastics and all that theological mm-hmm. gymnastics because. Mm-hmm. Clearly, God allowed it to happen. Right. And so where where people tended to lean in the circles that I traveled with was that scripture. What the devil intends for evil, God will come in and use for good. Which scripture is that? So that's in Genesis 50, 20. And that, you know, is something that... M- I mean, became almost like a mantra to all of us in many areas of our life, right? Anytime something bad happens, well, you know, the devil meant it for evil, but God can turn everything in, into good. And so that immediately became the narrative of this. And obviously, tons of grief, very sad, left, you know, two two little boys, orphans, left Melody pregnant with a very young child, wiped out an entire family that doesn't get enough acknowledgement, I will say. In yeah. researching this, you know, I found uh, the the website honoring Dee Dee Smalley and her children. And, you know, at the time that this happened, I didn't have any children. And now for where I sit as a mother of five children, that loss to that family mm. is insulting to me to sweep over with, well, the devil meant it for evil, but God meant it for good because Keith Green's life was so important. Right. And and yeah, of course, he was so much more important because it's this kingdom idea of everything is for this kingdom of God. And, you know, I, I one of the Christian mantras that drives me crazy is God is in control. God is in control. Okay. If that's true, if God is in control, then did God do this? Hmm. Or did God specifically decide to allow it? And is if it's for the greater good. So if God wanted to take Keith, right, because the mission of the kingdom of God could be better served if Keith was dead, because then that message could be used. Okay, so let's just give that, let's just say okay to that for a moment. Why kill children? Surely an all-powerful, all-knowing God could have done it differently if it's that Keith Green needed to die. Kill him, but don't fucking kill these kids. I mean, that just makes Mm. no sense at all. None. No, it doesn't. And it is insulting to everybody else who died in that plane because they were overshadowed. Their lives were overshadowed. The grief of their loved ones was overshadowed because they were all, what, just, you know, passengers in this bigger plan of God to catapult Keith Green to global status as a martyr? Uh, That makes me angry. Well, this is where, again, we can't really go into it, but mention the the whole YWAM thing. Yeah. So, I mean, we do have to go into it to a certain degree because on the heels of everyone's wrestling with whatever theology you were trying to come to grips with, YWAM supported the message of unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth. And this was the catalyst to start the memorial concert Mm -hmm. tours that the stated goal was to raise as many missionaries as could be done. And I think um, at the outset, they wanted to raise 100,000 missionaries through Keith's death. And just to be clear, these are young people who are going to pay their own way. They're going to pay money in the form of tuitions to attend discipleship training schools. And then they're going to have to raise their own support and pay money to the bases around the world of YWAM 
and there's a kick up portion of that. And I just don't even, ugh, oh my God. Okay. Yeah. Another, another episode. So back to this thing of why it needs to be spun this way for Keith. What's at stake here? So if Keith can continue to be seen as this giant of the faith, and like you said, almost a martyr for Jesus, rather than someone through his own arrogance and negligence killed himself and others, if he can be seen in the hero's light, well, then his products remain more financially viable. Yes. His albums, his writings, all of that. The memorial concerts can be used to recruit more for YWAM. Melody will definitely have a much more sympathetic victim status, right? She's the widow of a martyr. So kind of similar to the Elizabeth Elliot, Jim Elliot saga, which people can look that up. (laughs) However, (laughs) however, if the ultimate fault for the crash is laid primarily at Keith's feet, now what you're facing is an irresponsible executive who was not in compliance with contracts, not following the laws, taking a joy ride to show off, spiritually bullying and, and pulling a power trip over the pilot, killing not only himself, but two of his children, six other children, and two other adults. So to me, it sums up indulgence, negligence, arrogance, and gravity. These truths about the crash, they haven't been told. It's been glossed over for the sake of reputation and ambition and spiritual fairy tales. It it has been. And when you have someone achieve martyr status for what you just said, a joyride. And I Mm -hmm. think one of the crash reports where you referenced the hundred years of aviation experience, I mean, they pulled that one out as well. Like this wasn't even a necessary flight. This was a joyride to show off the ministry to a visiting family. This had no preparation. This wasn't in service of taking the gospel into the four corners of the earth. And yet the tale that has spun up from this is as though he was doing a life and death mission. Yeah. And the relevance, let's just, I want to pull it back to the relevance. So these same attributes of indulgence and arrogance, I mean, these are rampant in evangelical and fundamentalist circles. They're just everywhere. People need to be able to open their eyes and not be afraid to question Because sooner or later, that arrogance and indulgence, it gets other people badly hurt. And sometimes it even kills them. 